Today we're going to begin a new sermon series called Prophet, Priest, and King. Prophet, Priest, and King. If you've been around church very long or done very many Bible studies or just uh, hung around Christian circles at all, you've probably heard that threefold title, Prophet, Priest, and King, and you probably already know that it applies to Jesus. Well, what's that title all about? Where does it come from? And how might gaining a better understanding of those three offices, those three titles, and, the, and how they're squished together into a threefold title for Jesus, how, how might that help us know him more and love him better and serve him more? Like a lot of things that you come across in the Bible, there's, there's, have you ever noticed this, that, the, that God has a thing about numbers? Uh, and one of them is three. He's, he's, there's a lot of things that where he does a threefold thing, a uh, uh, it's, a, it's a hat tip to, to the Trinity. It's a hat tip to who he is. He's a three in one being, um, which we can't understand or explain, but we, we know that it's true. He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He created us in his image, and we're a three in one being. We're body, soul, and spirit. Uh, you just think of all those, those phrases in, in scripture that, that come out as kind of a threefold thing. In God's government, that he established for his people Israel, both in his instructions to them about what to do and how to do it, um, and his interactions with them, the way he interacted with the people, he did that through three offices, prophet, priest, and king. We usually hear them listed in that order, I think because that's the order that they show up in, in his story in Scripture. We, we see the prophets, and then there's the establishment of priests and priests, the priesthood, and eventually there's the establishment of the king. If you think about the way it was in King David's day, you can see all those, those offices functioning there in his kingdom. You have David, who was the king. Uh, by the way, how did he get to be king? He got to be king because Samuel the prophet went to his, his father's house and said, this is what God has said. Although when David went, he didn't know which one he was going to pick. The Lord just told him, go to Jesse's house, and when you get there, I'll show you. And you see a little bit of how the prophet works. He's, he's, he's being told by God, and so the Samuel, the prophet, anoints David uh, after the Lord says, he's the one. So David was the king, which meant he ruled over the kingdom. Then in his kingdom, there was various men who fulfilled that role as priest, most notably a guy by the name of Zadok. Zadok was a direct descendant of Aaron through Ezra. Uh, and during that time, there were several prophets that spoke the word of the Lord to the king. First Samuel, and then Samuel died. And then later, you see the prophet Nathan. Nathan was the one who confronted him about his sin with Bathsheba and, and told him a lot of different things from the Lord. The prophet, the priest, and the king. The prophet was somebody who was on the earth that God spoke to and spoke through to reveal his truth to specific individuals, but most, in a larger sense, to, to everyone, to all humanity, to reveal his will and sometimes to supernaturally reveal things that no human could know about what's going to happen in the future. And by the same token, in the same way, to supernaturally reveal things to, to the prophet that they couldn't otherwise know about what happened in the past, like how the world was created or how it was destroyed by a flood. He revealed those to Moses as a prophet. God uses prophets to personally write down or dictate to a scribe what God once said, what God once revealed. And all of those words... All of these words in this, this Bible came to be that way. God revealed his truth to prophets. They wrote it down or wrote it down, uh, dictated it to scribes. And then God carefully, carefully, carefully preserved his word over centuries and centuries and centuries so that we have right now today the words of God that were given to Moses and Elijah and Isaiah and Jeremiah. Isn't that miraculous? That's our Bible. These scriptures in Jesus' day were often re referred to as the Law and the Prophets. The Law was the first five books, the books that were given to Moses. And the rest of it was all the stuff that was given to the other prophets. And they were, they were called the Prophets. 
the law and the prophets. Sometimes they would use this little sort of symbolic shorthand. They would call it Moses and Elijah. Moses being a representative of, of the law and Elijah being a representative of all the other prophets. Kind of a symbolic shorthand indicating all that God had said. It's interesting to me that when, when Jesus appears to his disciples in his glorified state on the Mount of Transfiguration, two guys showed up there. Remember who it was? Moses and Elijah. It was like the word was being, was conferring and, and, and being encouraged and, 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 and uh, given a stamp of approval by the word, the Moses and the prophets. He was fulfilling all of, all that God had said. And so for Peter and James and John to stand there and see this, can you imagine that? The prophets were chosen by God and he used all different kinds. Uh, when you, when you go through the prophets, you find out that there was some from the high class and some from the low class and some from different geographic areas. So he used all different kinds of people, people that he just chose because of what God had ordained in them, what God had pre- prepared for them, what God had put into them, the situations he was going to put them in. He chose Jeremiah before he was born. In the same way, John the Baptist in the New Testament was chosen before he was born. Sometimes we get a lot of backstory about the prophets, where they came from, and, and other times we just they just show up and at the beginning of the book it says, and the word of the Lord came to this guy and he said, and that's all we know about, him, that the word of the Lord came to this prophet. One of my, my, one of my favorite verses about the prophets is from the book of Amos, who was a prophet, Amos 3.7, and here's what it says. Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plans to his servants, the prophets. Isn't that an amazing verse? Think about that for a minute. God tells us what he's going to do before he does it. Say, wait a minute. He does nothing? I think there's enough general scripture that tells us about the character of God that everything that God does has been revealed to us Maybe not every specific detail, but we know who he is and why he does what he does. What a glorious indicator of his great love for humanity that he would let us in. I mean, how many of you wives don't raise your hand? Get frustrated sometimes because your husband doesn't tell you what he's going to do or what he's thinking about or what he's doing. God always tells us, this is what I'm going to do. This is why I'm going to do it. If we'll, do, if we'll just look at what he's shown the prophets. So we have a great guarantee of the, the, the truth of his word. How do we have a guarantee of the truth of his word? Because he tells us what he's going to do, and then we see it come to pass. And we go, man, God tells the truth. He's, he's trustworthy. We can, we can believe him. We, so therefore, we can know that what he has written is a reliable authority for how we are going to govern our life. Because we can see God tells the truth and God knows what he's doing. He reveals to us what we need to know. Here's what Peter says in uh, 1 Peter 1. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was co- to come to you. What's he talking about? Jesus, the Messiah, salvation searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing. So the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of Christ, which is the Spirit of God, was in them, and they were they knew they were prophesying about something, this, this coming Messiah, what the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing to when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. The prophets of old, Jeremiah and and Isaiah, they, they, would, they would make these predictions and prophecies about the Messiah and said they were, they were really trying to figure it out and they searched intently. What were they searching intently? They were searching intently the words of the other prophets. What did Moses say? What did Samuel say? What did Ezra say? What did Zechariah say? So they could try to figure out what God was doing was, as he was predicting the, the death of Christ and the glories that would follow. Let's go on. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you, when they spoke of these things that now have been told to you by those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that was leading those prophets to write those words is the same Holy Spirit that's actually preaching right now. 
Can I say that? If I'm preaching the gospel, then that's true. Sent from heaven. This is Peter who was there at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell and the very first thing he did was get up and he preached the gospel and 5,000 people were saved. He says even angels long to look into these things. Now this is Second Peter, or should be, as we go on. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Do you have that, Molly, or did I write the wrong thing down? That's okay. In 2 Peter, he writes again in his second letter, and he says something about the, these scriptures. He says, I want, I want you to know, we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is 2 Peter 1.16. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my Son whom I love, in whom I am well pleased. Now, where did that happen? Two places. It happened when he was baptized, and it happened when they were on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was standing there with Moses and Elijah. They heard that same voice from the majestic glory saying, This is my son. Peter didn't have to wonder who Jesus was. He heard God say who Jesus was. But he realizes that not all of us have had that experience. So he says something else. In verse 19, We also have the prophetic message which is something completely reliable and you will do well to pay attention to it to a light shining in a dark place. Verse 20, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but the prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The, the Bible confirms its own accuracy. If we believe the Bible, then we believe the Bible. That's a profound statement, isn't it? So God established this office, office of a prophet to reveal his truth and reveal his will to humanity. And of course, Jesus is the ultimate manifestation and fulfillment of all three of these offices, prophet, priest, and king. Jesus is the ultimate mouthpiece of God. In the beginning was the Word. Jesus is the Word. He was the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. He is the perfect and ultimate fulfillment of God's speaking truth. He is the way and the truth and the light. Which brings me to the theme verse for this series. It's on the front of your bulletin, but it's Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. Now in this passage, which I'm going to read here in just a minute, but you're going to see Jesus in this passage fulfilling all three of these roles. All three of these offices. Prophet, priest, and king. David, Zadok, and Nathan, if you will. Here we go. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. I already talked about that. At many times in various ways. Over centuries. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Underline that in your, in your brain or in your Bible. Spoken to us by his son. What is that? That's Jesus' prophet. Jesus is speaking to us. Speaking the words of God to us. Whom, Jesus, the son... He appointed heir of all things. If he's heir of all things, what's that make him? King. And through whom he also made the universe. The Son of, is, the, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins. There's another phrase to underline. Provided purification for sins. What is that, priest? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. This is the one place in Scripture where it's very clear and, and very well outlined that Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. The prophet, God is speaking to us through, through Jesus, his prophet, spoken to us by his son. The priest, haven't talked about the priest yet. The priest represents the people before God. A priest stands between God and the people. Remember, remember when Moses was at the mountain and they said, don't let God speak to us anymore. You go speak to God. He's too scary for us. 
The priest represents the people before God. When, when the high priest would go in, and I'll talk about this next week, but when the high priest would go in, to the, to, to rep- he, he, he bore on him all these representations of the people, the 12 tribes on his shoulders and on his breastplate. He was representing the people before God, which is a scary job, right? Because the people, I am a sinful person. But the priest identifies with the people and brings their need before God. And through the work of the priest, God provides the proper sacrifice and the proper atonement. And he uses that work to bring forgiveness and redemption and reconciliation to the people. So the the priest is this intermediary. That's Jesus. He provided the purification for sins. He's our great high priest. But then there's the king. The king is the representation of God to the people. The priest is representing the people before God. The king is representing God to the people. The king is the one, right, who rules and reigns. The king is the one who establishes justice and, and what's right. What's, 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 what's going to be, if he's, a, if he's a good king, then he makes good laws. He establishes righteousness. He establishes justice. He punishes the wicked. He protects the innocent. He administers God's perfect control and sovereignty over the kingdom, ruling and reigning. So Jesus is king. Do you remember when Jesus was standing before Pilate and Pilate was talking to him and he, and he said, um, so they say you're the king of the Jews. You're, are you a king? What did Jesus say? He said, you speak the truth. You speak rightly when you call me a king, for that is what I am. But then he said this, but my kingdom is not of this world, otherwise my followers would fight to keep it. My kingdom is not, not of this world. And he could have said, yet. It's not of this world yet. Right now, it's a, it's a spiritual kingdom. It's like the kingdom of God is within you, right? That's what Jesus said. It's an internal kingdom that's in the hearts of, of us sitting here today. The kingdom of God is, is, is right here. It's among you. He's currently king, but right now his kingdom on earth is an invisible spiritual kingdom. But someday, the kingdoms of this earth will become the kingdom of our Lord and Christ. Revelation eleven fifteen. The world itself will be redeemed and given to Christ to actually rule and reign. And he will be king of kings and lord of lords and rule over all. Can't you? Don't you just want to be there? That'd be great. Prophet, priest, and king. I told Gabe and Deanna in our Wednesday staff meeting that I'm going to start out with priest, but on Thursday I changed my mind. I'm going to stick with the the biblical order and talk about Jesus as prophet today. You may have figured that out because of of all the, the groundwork I've already laid for prophet. There's a lot of different ways I could flesh that out and, and illustrate Jesus as prophet. We could talk about the Old Testament appearances of the angel of the Lord. In the Old Testament, there's times when there's this appearance and this theophany, the physical appearance of God on earth, and it's called the angel of the Lord. But it's not an angel, angel. And the reason we know it's not an angel, angel, is because um, when I say angel, angel, I mean a created angel that God created. The angel of the Lord is the messenger of the Lord. And in these times when the angel of the Lord shows up, oftentimes he receives worship. No created angel ever receives worship. They say, don't, don't worship me. I'm not God. We worship God. But when, a, when you see the angel of the Lord receiving worship, you know that's Jesus. When, when, when the Lord appeared to Moses, they ever get confused about this because it said the, the Lord spoke with Moses face to face. But then later, when, God, when, when, the, when Moses asked the Lord, show me your glory, he says, you must never, you not, can't look at my face because you'll die. So, so how is that possible? When, when God spoke to Moses face to face, that was Jesus. He was, he was delivering the, the words of God. He was telling Moses what to do. 
when, when, actually, when, when God passed in front of Moses, he put him in the, in the cleft in the rock and put his hand over him and said, I'll, I'll, I'll pass by and you can see my hind parts, but you're, my face you must not see. But it says the Lord was standing there with him and spoke to him. Who was that? That was Jesus. I said we could talk about that, and then I talked about it, didn't I? We could jump to the places in the New Testament where Jesus gives the very specific prophetic words, words of prophecy, like Matthew 24 and 25, where his disciples say, Lord, what will be the signs of the end of the age, and what will be the signs of your coming? And for three chapters, Jesus gives them the Olivet Discourse, and he tells them, here's what's going to happen. That's, that's prophecy. Jesus is a prophet. We could, we could talk about all the times he prophesied to his disciples about what was going to happen. We're going to go to Jerusalem. The chief priests and the, and, the, and the teachers of the law, they're going to kill me. And on the third day, I'll be raised again. Prophecy. But literally, every word that Jesus spoke and every action that he took was prophecy. He was speaking the words of God to humanity. When he, when he gave the Sermon on the Mount, he was prophesying. When he told parables, he was prophesying. When he healed lepers, he was prophesying. He was revealing truth about God. Look at John 5, 18 through 20. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. I want you to think about that because we're going to come back to that in a minute. For the reasons that, that are going to be described before and after this. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. He was telling them who he is. They wanted to kill him. Let's go on. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing, but because whatever the father does, the son also does. That's, that's prophetic living. God is working through Christ. Very similar scripture in John 12. There is, there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. Prophecy. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So, whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Let's stop there for a minute. Jesus is, is here telling us, the reason I only say what God tells me to say is because I know that God's words lead to eternal life. So I'm going to say what he tells me to say because I know that's the only thing that will, will bring people out of death and into life. I'm going to say it. What was the reaction, though, when he said those words? At the, the beginning of the last scripture, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill him. Jesus perfectly fulfills the role of prophet bringing God's words to humanity and humanity wants to kill him. What was said about him in John 1? He came unto his own, but his own received him not. On the day that he entered Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, he was entering Jerusalem and the people were proclaiming him king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Just like the prophet Zechariah had predicted. Over 400 years before, he will enter in Jerusalem riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey, and they, then he, even the words that the people would say were predicted. On that day, after the triumphal entry and the people were proclaiming him king, what did Jesus do next? Right? He ran up the steps of the temple like Rocky. Right? And then he took a victory lap around Jerusalem on the donkey. It's not what he did. He went to the mountain and he sat down and he wept. Now, why would Jesus go up to the Mount of Olives and sit down and weep when they just proclaimed him king? Because they knew, he knew what they were getting ready to do. He knew they were going to reject him. He knew they were going to kill him. In fact, he had twice told his, his disciples, once in Luke 13 on his way to the city, and then in Matthew 23, after he got to the city, here's what he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets 
and stone those who are sent to you. How oft I would have gathered you like a hen does her chicks, but you were not willing. What happened to the prophets? If they spoke the true words of God, if they were real prophets, that truth convicted people. And when people are convicted, one of two things happens. One, they either they, they surrender to God's truth, they believe the word, and they obey the word, and that happens with some people. Or they are offended by the word, they are angered by the word, they hate the messenger, and they kill the messenger. Even though the words that were being spoken are the words that would bring them life. Talk about your cancel culture. I mean, that was the original cancel culture. It wasn't we're going to take your Facebook page down, is we're going to stone you. When someone preaches the gospel, they are prophesying because they are bringing God's word, God's truth, to humanity. And when you preach the gospel, the devil does not like it. When you preach the gospel and you talk about sin and righteousness and judgment to come, which is what the Holy Spirit speaks according to Jesus, some will hear and receive and be redeemed and receive life. And so the, so the seed, some of it springs up. Some of it reaches maturity. But there's a lot of it that doesn't. Some will hear it and reject it and be angry with you and hate you. Here's what Jesus said in John 15. I told, I told Rob this morning, I said, you got a depressing Sunday school class today. And maybe some of you are saying that today too. This is a depressing message. It's the truth. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as itself. That's a pretty good thermometer. Pretty good indicator. As it is, you do not belong to the world. I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Remember what I told you? A servant's not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, did they persecute him? They will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me, hates my father as well. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But as it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my Father. That's a pretty depressing word. But this is to fill what is written in their law, they hated me without reason. It's depressing until you get to the end of the chapter. When Jesus said, I've told you all these things, so that you would have joy. Wait a minute, what? Take courage. I've overcome the world. The world's going to hate you, but I've overcome the world. There's ultimate victory. There's victory in the end. In between here and there, we're going to lose battles and battles and battles and battles, even though we're doing what is right and what is true and we're telling the, telling the truth, the actual words that would bring people to life. We're going to be hated. We're going to be persecuted. But in the end... There's victory. Jesus is our example. I've been noticing something, at least in my view, is increasing, and maybe maybe you're seeing this too. Something not only in the entertainment industry, that's been going on for a long time, but I'm seeing it now more and more in, in our news sources. Whatever news source you look at, internet, social media, mainstream network TV, there is an increase in stories that are making fun of Christ and the church and Christians. And unfortunately, there's, there's always some Christians who give them lots of, lots of fodder to use. 
and they pull those people out, and, and especially if they say anything about the devil, man, they are made fun of. I can't believe these people believe this stuff. It's so infantile. It just, it's just so, anybody who believes that is just so, that's happening. This, this is a preparation. This is a run up. This is a ramp towards the eventual persecution of anyone who will speak God's truth. Our example is Christ, and he told us that this would happen. He prophesied it. It would come to pass. They hated me. They will hate you. They persecuted me. They will persecute you. You can count on it. Don't think it's strange. But take courage. I've told you this is going to happen, so when it happens, don't, don't, don't be worried about it. You know it's coming. Take courage. I've overcome the world. There's, a, there's ultimate victory in Jesus. Every word in this book, every jot and tittle of it, is from God. All this scripture is God-breathed. He breathed it. He inspired it first to the prophets and then to the ultimate prophet, Jesus. Last night we were sitting in the, in the living room and we've been talking about a lot of stuff because there's a lot of stuff going on. We we hadn't been talking for about two hours. Des was cross stitching, 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 and I was looking at the TV while I was watching the KU game on my phone and following Casey Mays' baseball game, all at the same time. That's what I was doing. So not a lot of conversation, but we were in the same room. That's good. We were close. And all of a sudden, out of silence, Des goes, the God of this age has blinded their minds. And I kind of put my phone down and I said, what are you talking about? She said, honey, this has got to be forefront in all of our minds that what we're going through is not just a battle against flesh and blood. This is a spiritual battle. The God of this age is blinding the minds of the unbelievers and they cannot see the light of the gospel, which is the glory of God in Christ Jesus. We've got to, we've got to, to we've got to keep telling the, telling the truth. We've got to keep telling the truth, even though people are going to reject it. I said, I know. I know. That's what we've got to do. Spiritual warfare. All this scripture is God breathed. Every word of it is inspired to the prophets and then through Jesus, who is the prophet of all prophets, the priest of all priests, the king of all kings. And serving this king and his kingdom is not going to be easy because it puts us at odds with the God of this age. It puts us all at odds with the God of this world who is blinding the minds. And he's got a lot of tools that he's using. Now I'm going to throw a big piece of meat at you right now here at the end for you to chew on. Not only is Jesus prophet, priest, and king, but we're supposed to be that too. Wait a minute. Are you, are you saying we're supposed to be like Jesus? Well, yeah, I am. We're supposed to be like Jesus. We're not Jesus, but we're like Jesus. What does the scripture say? I have made you a kingdom of kings and priests unto the Lord. If you are speaking, every man should use whatever gift he has been given to serve. Let him who speaks speak as though he were speaking the very words of God. Take no thought what you'll say when you stand in front of kings and judges, for I will put the words in your mouth. We, we, are, we are priests unto the Lord. We stand in the gap for people. We intercede for them. We bring them before the Lord. Didn't we do that this morning in our prayer time? We, we, we make intercession. We bring our needs before the Lord. We say, Lord, we want to represent these people to you.
We're supposed to be ambassadors. That, that's, that's people who are, are representing a kingdom. It's not easy. Because as we do any of those things, it brings us into conflict with the culture, with the world that we're not supposed to be conformed to. And the world will continue to react to us in the same way it has always reacted to God's truth. Because we speak the truth while the world serves a lie. We point to the the straight and narrow way and few there be that find it while the world is busy paving a highway a wide road to hell. We serve life while the world is promoting and serving death. So is serving this kingdom here easy? No, it's hard. But this world is not all that there is. So stand firm. Take your stand so that when the day of evil comes, right? Stand on the word. Stand on the way and the truth and the life. Stand on the finished work of the great prophet, priest, and king, Jesus Christ. Let's stand. Lord, thank you. Thank you for being our prophet and our priest and our king. Thank you for being the perfect example and the, and the perfect fulfillment, Lord. We, we won't do it perfectly, but your spirit in us will lead us perfectly. Help us, Lord, to be of good courage. Be of good courage. Because you have overcome the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.